Hello, how are you doing? It's another beautiful, beautiful day that the Lord has made. Uh, and today we'll be doing something really, really that I've always wanted to uh, do. Actually, something that I've always wanted to preach about. That is uh, about love and justice. Love and justice. And uh, can there be love without justice? Can um, we be able to see love without uh, really doing some justice? Is God all loving, you know, like... <laughs> Can, can we say he's without, you know, there's, there's no question about it that he loves you all 100% and he'll always forgive you for anything that you do? Is that the nature of, uh, of God? Because uh, many people are still mixed up and they, they ask, does, it, does really God uh, show us unconditional love and there's no nothing that he can do? Like he loves us 100%. Uh, how can we be able to differentiate unconditional love and justice? Because um, this is something that we need to really, really understand how God works and how he can be able to show his love through justice. And today's um, uh, topic, it will be a bit, uh, um, a bit, uh, what do I say? I'll explain more. I've, I've always been teaching a lot, deep and deep and deep, but this one I like to explain much. Of course, uh, I'll show you a couple of verses, but I like to explain why God had to show uh, his love using justice. It's, it's, it's unlike men and the way we think. You see, the Bible says, uh, God's ways are not men's ways. The, it's the way we think and the way we react and the way we do things is not the same way how God does his things. He's righteous and his justice. So now, without wasting much time, let me get into the point. Now, let's start from the beginning. What really happened in the beginning? In the beginning, uh, God created Adam and Eve, and uh, we understand he, uh, the main reason why he created Adam and Eve was so that uh, basically him creating man was for the aspect of, um, uh, of course, having a relationship with man. And uh, he wanted, he did not create a robot. He created a human being who was to, you know, have a relationship with him, worship him, you know, be in his presence, someone who he can show love to, and then they show love back. That's why he gave us a free will. So God did not want to give us a, a, like, like a, a button or a switch whereby he just says, when I press this, you do as I want. No, he wanted us to think by ourselves. He wanted us to have a free will because once you have a free will, you can be able to love without, uh, you know, it's it won't be forced love. It will be, uh, an a con, unconditional agape love and that's exactly what god wanted with us so now what happened is uh, after he has he had created man he gave him uh, a will and he told him there is a tree of life you can eat from that tree of life uh and then i've also created another tree there which so that i can give you your will i i just don't want to be on one side i want you to make your own choice so he created another tree <clears throat> which was the tree of knowledge of good and evil and he told men that whatever you will do if you want to take this one this is what i recommend the tree of life but if you eat the from the tree of knowledge of good and evil then now you'll be on your own and if you're on your own, then it will mean uh, you will prefer being guided by your own thoughts, by yourself, more than me guiding you. It's just like the way a father tells his children that I want to show you the way, I want to show you what you need to do. But uh, most of the people, they say, no, I don't want <laughs> daddy's way. I want to go my own way. I, I want to join with uh, some bad company and do this. Uh, no, daddy, I know, I know, I know. You see, that, that kind of way where people uh, do such kind of a thing. And uh, after God gave that option, of course, we understand that there was a deceiver who is called uh, Satan, of course, in form of a serpent. He came and he deceived Adam and Eve. And uh, he told them that, uh, you see, if you eat from the 
the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you'd be like God. Remember, man was already in the image of God. Man already was in the image of God. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing, Satan was already lying to man that, hey, you will be like God. So I wonder what other nature did Satan think in his head or this deceiver? He just wanted to tell man that you'll be in a very, very different nature or you'll be maybe mightier than God and things like that. Of course, the normal deception that he always has. And uh, after man being deceived, he went, of course, in the wrong way. And after he ate from the tree of knowledge uh, of good and evil, then immediately something happened man died when i say man died i don't mean he died there and then like his physical body died but his spirit died so he had a dead spirit walking he was like a like a zombie have you ever seen a zombie who is dead like uh, this uh, zombie apocalypse movies it's like you have no spirit you're just because remember man was created in the image of god and the image of god is three parts there's body the soul and the spirit. So body, soul, and spirit, that's the image of God. That's three out of three. So the, the body of uh, God is, you, you see, we say that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus is like, there we can say the body, the outer body, the way you see the body. And then we have the soul. The soul is like the way we say God the Father. God the Father, you cannot see him when you're alive. It's not possible. And of course, we have the spirit who is the Holy Spirit. So it's three parts uh, in one body. So we are created in the image of God like that. So now what happened is that uh, man died, the spirit died. So the spirit which was in man, it died. So man now was operating in two parts. That is the body and the soul only. The soul is there, but of course, it uh, the spirit is dead. So what happened is that this dead spirit, uh, it, uh, it, it, it would make man at a certain point to be able to die, like naturally fully die. Now, what, what was going on is that man started decaying. You see, God did not want, did not create that kind of style whereby man could decay and, uh, you know, end and all that. No, he created him in a certain way that he would live probably forever or for, for the longest time, because there was also a tree of life there, which could add him more and more years and more and more time. And of course, after man having sinned like this, he discovered that, hey man, I was, I'm naked, I'm naked. I, I, I'm, I'm in another state and I don't know what I can be able to do. So they started hiding themselves in bushes. And when, and when God came, he asked uh, Adam and Eve, hey, where are you guys? What, what's happening with you? Then Adam and Eve, they said, we are hiding from you <clears throat> because you are naked. And then God asked them, who told you that you are naked? They said, uh, you see this and this and this happened. They gave the whole story about uh, the, what happened and them eating the fruit. And uh, of course, you know, long story short, you understand what happened, that uh, God uh, killed an animal and clothed them, okay? Because <laughs> one, we have to understand that uh, God is a God of justice. And he said that uh, he will also always show his uh, love through justice. Now, God did not just wake up and say, okay, I know you've done this thing. Let me just forgive you. It's okay. You just go on. Let's continue. No, God is holy. He's a hundred percent holy. So the only way he could be able to do on this situation was either uh, to just decide that, uh, you see, man, you have to die right away. Or the other uh, thing is that he decides and just says that uh, I have to find a way for you to be able something else or someone else to die for your sake, because there have to be death of something. Blood has to be shed. You see, the Bible tells us in Leviticus 17, 11, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given you the blood to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So now there had to be shedding of blood out so that 
somebody can be able to for, be, uh, you know, the, the sins can be covered. I won't call it forgiveness of sins because it was not really possible to forgive sins at that time. It is only sins which are being covered. So the first shedding of blood was done by God himself. God is the one who shed the first blood where in the garden of Eden, when they sinned, when Adam and Eve, they sinned, God, God uh, killed an animal then, then, and then he used that blood of the animal to, uh, to he used that blood of an, uh, the animal as a symbol of atonement. Atonement is basically to make at one, to make at one, at one meant, all right, with him. And uh, of course, he took the, the, the animal, he removed the skin, and then he clothed them with the, the skin of the animal. So after that, days went by, and then we see, of course, God has introduced the blood. There has to be an animal, which is a, a sacrificed, and then the blood shed to represent blood, to represent a death, because of sin. So once you sin, once you do something wrong, there had to always be bloodshed. And we see this one very well portrayed in the story of Cain and Abel. Now, Cain and Abel, the Bible tells us that they went to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, when they went to call upon the name of the Lord, what happened? Uh, Abel gave, uh, he, he, he was farming animals. Probably, I think, uh, Cain and Abel had they knew somehow about the the aspect of blood because it was already introduced by God, but they were still bargaining. Probably, I I think they were still maybe bargaining of uh, should we give blood or should we give our our works? You know the things that we have worked. So Abel, because he was herding cattle and sheep and all that, he went and gave a sacrifice of an animal. He gave a sacrifice of an animal and uh, he killed the animal and blood was shed and God accepted uh, the sacrifice. And now when we come to Abel, I mean, when we come to uh, Cain, this is what happened. Cain, instead of giving as the way God indicated and the way God wanted things to be, giving the blood, sh shedding the blood of an animal to cover his sin, he gave his works. He gave his works. He gave uh, the things that he was farming in the farm, watermelons, oranges, you know, bananas, uh, skumawiki, and everything that he was cultivating. So that is what he went and sacrificed for God. So when he sacrificed that, God did not want Cain's works. So he refuted that sacrifice and the smoke did not go up. It scattered everywhere. But now instead of Cain asking his brother Abel, why is it that your sacrifice has been accepted and mine has not been accepted? Instead, he felt jealous and he felt in fu uh, furious and then he killed his brother. So he shed the blood of his brother and killed him, which was, <laughs> of course, we know that was the first death, the first murder of human being. Then after that, we see, as the story continues, men started being evil and evil and evil and evil because the seed of sin was already in man. And God really wanted to do whatever he can to rescue man because he really loved men. He really loved human beings. And uh, he was looking for a way to redeem these people because uh, he, uh, the only way they could be redeemed is through the blood, through death, because God could not go against um, his uh, commands because God said that I am holy. I cannot stay where there is sin. Now, man here comes, he has already sinned. And after he has sinned, now God cannot stay where man is unless his sin is covered because he cannot stay where he can be able to see sin. It's not possible for God to stay in the same place where there is sin because it's too holy for that. So now God had to find a solution. Now, as the days went by, you know, the story of Noah and all the flood and everything, but the, the world became so evil and then God destroyed the whole earth. But there was one guy called Noah who the Bible says that uh, he found grace. Noah found grace with God. Because why? Because Noah was someone who was at least trying as much as he can to go in the way of the Lord. The Bible says Noah was a righteous man. Noah was a righteous man and Noah uh, pleased God. Now, having pleased God, God elevated Noah 
and they put him uh, in the ark and then he was not destroyed. Then after that, of course, after the flood, then uh, things settled down and Noah, uh, you know, got other children and children got other children and things like that. And as the days went by, sin still rampaged a look again, back again, because you see, th th these people had a hard heart. You know, once you're sinful, you have the sinful nature, you have a heart of stone. You see, you have a heart of stone. You cannot be able to comprehend why, why am I behaving like this? Why am I so hard on people? Why am I so, uh, so sinful? Why is it? Like, have you ever woken up sometime and you ask yourself, why is it that I'm always so much sinful? I do things in a way that uh, I do not even want to do this, but I don't know. I don't understand myself what is really wrong with me. So people had a heart of stone and they continued sinning and sinning and sinning. So God was like, because he had promised Noah, he would uh, never again destroy the earth with water. And he promised that and he sealed it using the rainbow. He showed the rainbow and said, this is a sign Noah that he'll never again destroy the earth with water. But now, since God had already said that and promised that, now he was like, what's going to happen? These people are really, really so much evil. But then in the midst of all that confusion, another guy showed up who was called uh, Abraham. Abraham was someone who was walking in the ways of God. He used to please God. He, he, he tried as much as he can. You see, Abraham was not... 100% holy. You see, most people, they, they, they think that uh, God wants you to be 100% holy, come when you've already stopped sinning, come when, when you've already stopped doing everything. No, God doesn't look like uh, at you like that. No, uh, Abraham was just a normal guy. He was living in a place called Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, where his fathers used to, his father used to worship the, the gods of the, you know, the gods of the sun and things like that. So they, he was just, you know, he was just there. Definitely one point or another, they, he could find himself in that, you know, chaos of people worshiping some strange things. But deep down in his heart, he had a feeling of wanting to do what is right. And you see, God always plucks us from uh, the point whereby we are trying to seek him, but we don't really understand who God is. This one is a good example to explain to us. It's not about how much you've done or how good you are or what you're able to do or uh, the things that you're good at or how much uh, you're trying to show yourself being holy and things like that. No, God looks at the intentions of our hearts. Abraham had an intention of being a good person. So now God gave him a test. He told him, Abraham, because I'm seeing you're really trying to find the truth, I want to uh, give you uh, a test here. I want you to leave that land, Ur of Chaldeans, where your fathers live, and you go to a place where I will show you. I want to separate you from the world. I want to separate you from these people who are always sinning against me. And I want to show you another land where I'm going to give you. And Abraham did not refuse. Abraham left. And actually, I, I just imagine Abraham and his family and they are going and they actually don't know where they're going. They're just going and going and going because God had told them, go, I will show you a new land. He did not tell them, I'll show you, go to that land or something. No, he just told them, go. But because of this faith, you see, the Bible says faith is the substance. Let me, let me read for you this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, Abraham had faith and he believed God that whatever God is saying, he's saying it in a truthful way. So now he went to wherever God was saying and he just started his journey with his family. And as they were going, and uh, of course, I'm sure so much was running in his mind. And now when he reached there, wherever God was telling him, God saw that this was really bold. Out of all the people who are sinful and they don't want to hear me, this guy has decided that he will do according to my will. And uh, the Bible there and then says that Noah was the father of faith, you see? So God made Noah the father of faith because he was the first person to have a, a lot of faith on something like that. Forget the times of Noah. I'm talking about Abraham right now. So Abraham had 
faith in God. And through that faith, God called him the father of faith. And God promised him several things. He told him that because you have believed in me, because you've done what I've told you, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Look at the skies. You see all those stars? Look at the sand of the sea. You see all that? Your children will be so many that you'll not be able to count them. So now, there's a problem now. Remember, Abraham did not have children. Uh, his uh, wife, Sarah, was barren. So he was wondering, okay, how is it going to be? But still, he believed. And of course, the story goes and over and over. And then later on, we understand that Sarah came to get a child, Isaac. And the, the story goes down. And I don't want to speak much about that. I want to go to the main point. So now, after Abraham, we see Isaac came in. And then after Isaac, we see the 12 tribes of Israel. They came, um, I mean, after Isaac, we see Jacob, who was later renamed uh, Israel. And then after that, we see the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, who uh, went to you know Egypt through their brother Joseph? Um, then after that, they, they stayed there for about two, 400 years, and then they were held in captivity. They became slaves there, and God sent Moses. And after God sent Moses, now they were told they are going back to the promised land, which is in Canaan. So now along the way, there was a lot of drama and uh, so many things, and others were not believing in Moses, what he's saying, and all this hassle. And then now God was always wondering, these people of mine, I called them, I promised Abraham that he'll be a father of many nations. And I promised him that these people, they will have that land forever. The one which is in Israel, in Canaan. And uh, they will live there forever. But now these people are always 24-7 trying to do things against me all the time. And you see, because of the human heart, they had this kind of thing whereby you find uh, they're always, they, it's like a heart of stone. They are always doing mistakes. They're always doing wrong things. God is saying one thing, they're doing another thing. God punishes them in one way. You see, they come back again. They do the same thing over and over again. And we see the story unfolding and folding and unfolding. And God, through Moses, he told the children of Israel, I want us to have an agreement. How you're going to love me? And uh, when you do what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to bless you. And if you go against what I've told you, then you're going to be cast or not, not cast. You're going to, you know, get a, a punishment for that. So now this set of rules is what we call the commandments. So now commandments were given. So do, these commandments which were given, they were to help the Israelites to try and be as the way God wanted them to be. So the commandments were given, of course, the 10 commandments. Later on, we see others and other many, many other laws. As they were doing more mistakes, God was trying to bring other stories and telling them, no, don't even do this, don't even do this, change this one here and there. He's adding more and more rules to try and just to make them, you know, be the kind of person that he, he chose them to be. To, be, to be able to show the world what how God wants things to be like. But these people, they were always doing mistakes and it was very hard and difficult for God to always try to push them this way and that way because the problem was not even the loss. It was because they had a heart of stone and God through his prophets different prophets that he appointed, uh, we, we have Jeremiah, we have Isaiah, we have uh, Ezekiel and all that. God sent different prophets to try and talk to them. And he said through these prophets that one day Jesus would come and he would soften their hearts. He will remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of, a heart of flesh. Because the main issue here was the heart. And uh, as we see the days goes by, going by, Jesus shows up after uh, a very long time. I remember there was almost 400 years just before Jesus came. God was silent. Everything was silent. There's, you know, there's no talk of anything. It's like there's no prophet talking. But of course, after 400 years is when we see John the Baptist introduces, hey, prepare the way, prepare the way. The Messiah is coming and all that. So when Jesus came, because these people had a very hard heart. They could not even comprehend 
that Jesus, the Messiah, the promised uh, seed of David, he's already here. Now, I want you to look at um, the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, these guys, they knew the whole law. They knew the whole, you know, law of God. They are the ones who used to translate the, the law. They used to teach people in the synagogues because they were the teachers of law. They were religious leaders. They knew everything from cover to cover. That was their work. But now you see there's something which was with these Pharisees. The Pharisees did not, did not they were not able to comprehend and to understand the, the mind of God because of their hearts, their nature of their hearts, they did not have any love. All they had is a set of rules. We will do this to this. We will do this to this. We will do this to this. And uh, once you do that, you're okay. I think God is fine with you. When you do this to this, when you do. So they, all they were thinking in their brains was that God has just puts a set of rules to guide you and to tell you this is what you're supposed to do. So if somebody does this, this is the penalty. If you, it's, it's like they, they, they turned God into some kind of robot whereby you just go and press button. You have done this, press that button. You have done this, press that button. But when Jesus came, he showed them another different way of doing things. He started translating to them and explaining to them the law of Moses and not only destroying the law, he did not, he says that I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. So he was telling them, how do you fulfill this law? If it's for example, do not kill. Jesus said, it's not even about the killing, which is the issue, is the thought of killing. So if you think of killing your brother or if you hate your brother, you've already killed him in your heart. Look up. The Bible says fornication. It's not even about the fornication. Jesus even expounded more. He said, it's not even about the fornication, the issue. When you think about it in your mind, you've already done it. So Jesus was trying to say, it's all about the mind and in the heart. Why? Because he wanted to transform and to translate their hearts from the heart of stone and give them a heart of love, a heart of flesh, all right? So Jesus demonstrated how a righteous person is usually like. So as we continue, the story goes down. We see that uh, Jesus comes and then he dies for everyone. And uh, the whole story, you understand how it goes. Then after that, because of course, even being killed, Jesus was killed because these people are not even understanding what Jesus is talking about. But then when Jesus was living, he told his apostles, I'll not leave you as orphans, but I'll bring you a helper who will abide in you forever. So this helper is the Holy Spirit. Now, the moment the Holy Spirit came into the hearts of men, their hearts were transformed. That is the moment that their hearts were changed from the heart of stone to the heart of flesh. And all of a sudden, everything started being, becoming new. And God used the Holy Spirit to be able to change people's minds and to change the way they think and the way they react. And from those kind of rules that they, they put in their minds, that it's all about rules and rules and rules, to only one rule, which is love your God with all your heart and with all your mind and soul. and uh, Love your brother as you love yourself. So the whole law was translated into one word, which is love. So when you get born again, you get to uh, get a new heart and a new mind. Now, why? Why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to do all this? Why is it that he could not have just done it all of a sudden and uh, and uh, just decided, okay, I'm going to change your hearts and I'm going to do this one for you uh, during the time of Adam and Eve or time of Noah or time of, you know, back then. It is because of one thing, which is called justice. There is no way you can be able to show love without justice. Now, God himself, he really loved man. But think about it. Think about it. Uh, le let me give you a good example. If... Uh, there's a thief who has maybe murdered someone and then he's taken to court. And when he's taken to court, uh, the, the magistrate or the judge says, uh, let's listen to your story. He says the story that, you know, the, the accusers, they say the story, but 
the judge says, I'm a really, really merciful judge. And because I'm really merciful, I'm going to let this murderer go away because I'm really merciful and I don't want to do, uh, you know, I don't want to hurt this person. How is it going to be with a family which has been uh, messed up with? They are going to say, this is a very corrupt judge. He doesn't keep his word. He says something which is, <laughs> which is not uh, supposed to be done. Why did he not show us justice? Why did he forgive this murderer? Why? Because of one thing, there should be justice to be able to show love. So God himself, he looked and he said, for me to be able to show justice to these people and to show them how justice looks like, then I have to make sure that I do it in the way that I say. There have to be the payment of death for them to be forgiven. If, if, if somebody has sinned, he has to die. If he doesn't have to die, then someone else has to take that penalty and die. It's like, it's like going to, maybe you have done something so wrong, you have killed someone, and then you go to court, and you're told, hey, Keith, you did this and this, you killed someone. And then the judge says, okay, you're supposed to go and be uh, killed. You're supposed to go and be hung. And uh, just before you go to be hung, the judge tells you, but excuse me, there's something here. There's someone who left a document here. Uh, he was an innocent person. He never did anything. He never uh, killed anyone. But then he gave his life. He died. He was hung some time back and he left a copy here and he said, whoever will have a case of murder and will be uh, you know, he'll be going to the to the guillotines or wherever to be hanged, then let him know that I've done it for him. As long as he believes this is for him, then he will go scot-free. Now, that is exactly what Jesus did. Instead of you dying for your own sin, he came and he said, okay, I am going to do this for you. I am going to die in your position so that if you believe in what I have done, then you will live scot-free. That is how I have to demonstrate my love for you by giving myself so that I may fulfill the justice, the love through justice. Because if God could have said, whoever sins, he will die. And then he just says, okay, I forgive you for doing whatever you have done, then God will not be a just God. He will be a corrupt God. And for him to be able to do it right, he had to ask himself, what am I going to do? I've already given my rule. And my rule is that whoever sins, he must die. So I have to send my son, my only son, to come and die for these people in their position, so that if they believe that this death was for them, then they will not perish, but they'll have eternal life. Are you seeing the whole aspect of uh, salvation, the way it came to be, and why God had to show love through justice? If he could not have done this justice, then you see there are people always complaining and saying, so Jesus paid our sin to who? To Satan? Or to God, they hear is to God the Father. So they wonder how can God that you know kill himself for the sake of himself? You know, people are always confused and they ask, How is it that God died so that he can fulfill the wrath of himself? Himself, he died so that he can fulfill the wrath of himself. Like it doesn't really make sense to most people. They are they're always wondering, how can it be like this? But it's because of justice the aspect of justice. I don't know if you have really understood uh, what I'm talking about. I don't know if you have understood this whole aspect of justice. It's, it's, it's something that uh, it's a bit complicated to understand, but it is shown very, very well in the aspect of justification in the courts, because God is a, is a justifier. He's a justifier and uh, he does exactly what he has said. He The Bible tells us that God God is not man that he can repent. He's not man that he can say, whoever sins, he will die. And then the other day he says, okay, you sinned, but it's okay, I forgive you. But also because the seed of sin was already in man and it was so difficult for them to be able to, you know, think straight. And that's why Jesus had to come and he died for your sins. And also 
You remember I told you as we were starting that when man sinned, Adam and Eve, they sinned, they died, their spirit died. Now, when someone gets saved right now and they get the Holy Spirit, what happens? The Holy Spirit replaces the dead spirit in their lives. And now they become a full three out of three parts kind of a person. So they return back again to the image of God. And of course, we know the body uh, is still a sinful body, but it's already like the Holy Spirit, we are told that is the assurance, is the assurance that you will be given a new body. And one day, one time, when the rapture comes, or when you die and you go to, you know, you when you die and, and the day of redemption comes, you'll be redeemed from this fallen body, this fake body, which is always sinning, and you'll be given another body. That's why we are told the Holy Spirit will quicken us. He will quicken us. He will change us from the person that you have always been, the sinful person, the person who is always messy and things are always wrong with him. And now we will be given another new body. So in a, in a, in a, in like a general understanding is that when you get saved, you have already become three parts out of three parts. It's only that your body is just waiting to change that. It's already, you already have the assurance who is the Holy Spirit in you. But if you're not saved, you're still two out of three. Two out of three, if you divide two, divide by three, what happens? <laughs> if you divide two out of three, you get 0.666. Have you ever heard the Bible saying this is the number of man? It basically means this is the, the fallen man. This is the fallen man. So <laughs> it's so amazing that people don't really understand this. And there, there are people who say, you say, for me, I'm a good person. I give, I help the needy. I do, I, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't curse. I don't do all those things. I, I, I think I'm a good person. But no matter how good you are, unless you get born again, it's, it's so difficult for you. You will not be able to get into heaven. So this is a very easy and, uh, and a very quick way of understanding the whole aspect of why God had to use justice to show love. And uh, of course, I'm sure um, maybe someone there might be having a question. If you have a question, maybe you can just type there. You can ask me any question. I'll, I'll answer right now. Today, I'm just uh, explaining a bit so that people can be able to understand. Just you can uh, type any question there which you have concerning salvation and, uh, you know, anything concerning the Bible and uh, Jesus and all that so that I can tell you anything that you always have as we continue. So, what I've been able to explain to you is a whole aspect of what God was doing. And uh, most people are always mixed up with this story. And many, many, many people, they always try to ask, why does, do we have to see Jesus dying on the cross? And if Jesus was dying at the cross to pay for our sins, who was he paying to? That question is always asked and I've explained to you. And many, many people, they used to think that he was paying the, the price to Satan. Others were saying, oh, he was paying, because we were already, you know, sold unto sin. Sold unto sin to who? We were already sold to Satan? No. God was paying that price to himself so that justice can be achieved. Justice to be achieved. It's, it's, it's something that when you sit down and you try to analyze it so well, you'll be able to understand. So the justice was being paid to God the Father because he had already set a rule and this rule could not be broken. And that's why he had to send Jesus to pay a penalty. And that's why if, if you check concerning the fallen angels, the um, they are called what the, the 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 fallen angels, uh, Satan and all that. Jesus did not. There, there was no arrangement. There is no plan of redemption for that. So once they sinned, and uh, God did not put a plan for them of how they can be redeemed, there is no way they could be able to be redeemed. So their fate was already closed. But God had a lot of mercy on human beings. Why? Because 
because of uh, I, I think it's just grace and also another thing before the foundations of the world god already knew what man could would do because god also sees the future despite the much that uh, he loves us and he knew uh, he will create us he knew that <laughs> with just one click of a mouse because satan was there and uh, you know satan is a deceiver he knew that definitely satan is going to deceive these guys and after they uh, they they get deceived they will fall and uh, when they fall i have to devise a plan before the foundations of the world, God already ordained, had already ordained the redemption. He already knew how he will redeem mankind. That's, that's, that's something just to think about and see how much loving is God. For him, even before he creates human beings, to already plan a redemption way. And... Uh, this is something that you have to think about and analyze it in as much as you can, because with, without thinking about that, 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 that's why salvation is something that you need to un understand. You see, most people think that salvation is just some repetition that you do. No, it's something that you have to understand. Why? Why on earth did Jesus have to die for our sins? Why on earth did God have to send him here? Why? Why did we hear that Jesus died for your sins? How does it apply to me? You see, before the time that I was saying that, I've, I, I've, before I really got saved and understood the gospel, I, I had gotten saved like almost 30 times or 20 times. I remember from when I was a young boy, I was always getting saved every Sunday or every month or something. And I was saying the same, same story, like, God forgive my sins, you died for my sins, you rose again. The same statement, I always say that statement all the time, but I had not understood, I had not understood. I was always asking myself, why is it that we're always praying that Jesus died for our sins, rose again? It had never sunk in my brain, and I was always asking myself, why? Why is this? So every night I would pray over and over again and tell God, please, if you're coming tonight, just scare me to say that prayer again. And it was until I understood why Jesus died for me. And I understood the whole concept from Genesis till that's the time that I was able to change my mind and have a complete repentance. And once you have that and you understand, because salvation is all about understanding, you can never be saved. I see, uh, John, you're asking me, do you want to say we are, we are for heaven after we have sinned to God? What was the purpose of us being created here on earth? Now, first we have to understand the purpose of us being created on earth was so that we can please God. God created us for his own pleasure. We were to please God and to have a relationship with him. But of course, after man fell, it was directly opposite. We wanted now to please ourselves. And uh, you have asked, um, do you want to say we are for heaven after we have sinned to God? Now, when Jesus came, he went to the cross. And after he went to the cross, he died for the sins of the whole world. And just before he died, after the blood was shed, his blood was already shed, everything until he was now shedding water. He said one thing, that it is finished. So what was finished? The payment of sin was finished. Now, the only thing which makes uh, uh, one person saved and another not saved is not because he was not forgiven. Hitler was already forgiven. Every evil man that you know here on earth who has lived after Jesus has been here was already forgiven. But now the problem is they have never believed that forgiveness. That's why the Bible is always about believe. Whosoever believes for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes, believes what? Believes that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and uh, rose again. He died for you. Whosoever believes will not perish, but will have everlasting life. You see the point? So the aspect here is that salvation is through believing. It's not through stopping sinning. 
you see, this is a very complex thing. And uh, if 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 uh, you have any more query or you need uh, to understand better, you can just still type uh, there and I'll answer you. You see, uh, what I was saying is that the main thing which makes people not get saved is because they have never understood why Jesus had to die and they believe that he did that for themselves, for them. But if you just think that uh, salvation is all about stop sinning, then uh, you're really mixed up. You're just like the way I used to think. I used to think, ah, today I've lied to someone, tomorrow I've done this, tomorrow I have to stop lying, I have to stop this, I have to stop this, and then now I come and I'll be saved. And if I lie to someone or do something wrong, then I'm no longer saved. I have to be saved again. No, it's never like that. Because Jesus said, come the way you are, Believe that I died for your sins, was buried and rose again, according to the scriptures. That is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's where the gospel is. After you do that, something will happen. The Holy Spirit will come inside you. All of a sudden, it'll come inside you. And when the Holy Spirit comes inside you, he will give you a new heart and a new mind. And he'll make you a new creature. So when he gives you a new heart, the old heart, which was always after wrong things and the old mind which was always after thinking evil things will be gone and now you'll have a new mind which thinks righteous things and a new heart which is all after god and now the holy spirit will start transforming you slowly and slowly and you'll come from a baby carnal christian to a spiritual mature christian so you don't stop sinning and come you first come to God, you understand, and you believe. The Holy Spirit gets in, he changes you, and he makes you the person that he molds you until you grow into the person that God wanted you to, to be. I don't know if I've answered you uh, that well. You can type there if it's okay. Or if you have any, any other question, you can ask. So uh, I see somebody else here writing also, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Why do we see some pastors and some other believers trying to invite the Holy Spirit when about to pray or when worshiping? So now you see, when you see somebody saying, Holy Spirit, we invite you. How do you invite someone who is already in the house? You see, the Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of God. Our bodies are the temple of God the house where God dwells. So the Holy Spirit dwells in us when we are saved. But we are in Christ and Christ is in us. You see, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And of course, the Holy Spirit is sealed inside us according to Ephesians 1.13 in whom you believed after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you believe you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the Holy Spirit is sealed in you. So if you're saying you're inviting Holy Spirit to invite you here, then it doesn't really add up because how can you invite someone who is already inside you? Maybe if they are meaning that we, 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 you know, we're asking you, Holy Spirit, to continue filling us, filling us more, then that's a different story. But also remember, in filling of the Holy Spirit does not come as an event. You see, the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you hear the things of God, the more every day you're learning the Bible, every day you're praying, every day you're walking in the ways of God, the Holy Spirit is getting filled inside you, is filling you, is filling you more and more. So it's not an event. It's not like an event whereby somebody just lays hands on you and then the Holy Spirit is infilled. No, it's, it happens by the more you're living and walking with God and the more you're doing things which are godly, the more the Holy Spirit gets more and more and more and more in you, okay? Of course, you have seen um, incidences where the Bible talks about, um, you know, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That is especially in the book of Acts. But remember, the book of Acts is a transitional book. It is transitioning from the time of the Jews to the time of the church age. All right. So and as we transition to the church age, we see more and more about faith, different, different from the way in the, in the Jewish, um, in the time of the, the Jews. It was more about sight. 
you see, Paul tells us that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. They will not live by sight, you see. Because sight is all about signs and signs and signs. We have to see, we have to see. And the Bible tells us very well, signs were for the Jews. But now the Gentiles believe by faith. You see, for us is more about faith. How much you read the Bible and how much you understand God and you reveal yourself more and more to God and more and more, you'll be able now to get a lot of faith. You'll get a lot of power. You'll get filled by the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's very important to read the word of God every day. The more you don't read the word of God, the more you quench the Holy Spirit. It's like the Holy Spirit is there, but it's quenched. You don't feel the power. You don't feel the, the urge. You don't feel when you stay away from God, he will, you know, you will quench him. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit has left. He's there. He's inside you. And he will never live until the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30, it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is inside you. He does not leave you. You cannot lose your, uh, you cannot lose your salvation. Holy Spirit cannot come out of you when he has already entered. You see? But when you don't follow the Bible, you don't read the Bible, you don't fellowship, you don't do anything, you quench the Holy Spirit. He is there, but he's too diluted you just feel him at the far end you know and uh, of course that one removes the joy of salvation and many many other things and of course your rewards in heaven and stuff like that so i hope that one was well answered so in case if you have any question you can ask me any biblical question if you have uh, kindly you can just type there and i'll and i can address it right away here if there's something that uh, you've been thinking and asking yourself Concerning the Bible, concerning, uh, you know, the second coming of Jesus, concerning the rapture, concerning salvation, concerning anything, you can just type here and I can explain to you so that uh, you can be able to understand. Uh, meanwhile, as uh, I'm waiting for maybe someone to, to type something, I like to also expound a little bit and tell you that uh, for those who have never been saved, one thing you have to understand is the aspect of the blood. The blood is one of the most important aspects of salvation. And if you go to a church and they, 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 tell, you, they, they tell you you have to come to Christ in any other way, then they are lying to you. Because the blood is everything that we need to believe in. That blood which was shed by Jesus and he shed it out of himself to represent death. Because like I told you, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. You can't be forgiven without shedding of blood. Why? Because God is just. And like I was talking about this, I said God has to be just. Justice has to be done. Okay? So the blood had to be shed to represent death of that sinner. But Jesus died. He shed his blood. So if you trust this blood, which was being shed by Jesus, and you say, that blood was supposed to be mine. And you trust it and you say, I trust this blood. I trust that Jesus died, shed his blood for me. Then my friend, you're saved. Because the Bible is very clear about this. Romans 3, 25 in whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. God has set forth who? Jesus. He set forth Jesus to be our propitiation through faith in his blood, which is really, really profound. All right. So now, after you believed the gospel, the gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. There's something else that, uh, which is, uh, I believe is also important to do, but um, it's not, a, it's important, but I will not call it a must, which is confessing. You see, the Bible says in Romans, uh, I think it's in 10, Romans 10 or uh, something like that. Let me, let me, let me check it out here. This is always confusing people so much. Romans uh, 10 verses nine, it says that if you shall confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, can you confess something that you don't know? 
No, you have to understand what you're confessing about. If you have, if you have been called by the court of law and you're told, come and explain to us what you saw. Can you go and give a confession of something you didn't see? Uh, I went there. I was not really. I'm not really sure if that thug, you know, that thief, he, he crossed the wall, he jumped the wall, and things like. The judge will just tell you, no, 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 first go, go. We want someone who understands, who has seen it, who has understood what happened about this event. So unless first you understand, then there's no need of confessing because you confess only what you know. So you first have to know that Jesus died for you. You understand it and you believe it. Then now confessing is just basically telling God, this is what I believe you've done for me. This is what I believe. And the Bible says that uh, it, for it is with the heart that you believe unto righteousness. From the heart you believe to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When you confess, you say, this is what I believe then now that is exactly what God wants you to do. But uh, of course, confession has to first come by through understanding and believing in your heart. Why am I saying this? Because look at the deaf and the dumb. Does it mean because they cannot talk, they cannot uh, go to heaven because they cannot speak anything? No. If uh, by the words of your mouth, it's all that how you get, uh, you know, to be saved, then that's a different story because it first has to start from the heart because you can, uh, do you know that you can talk in your brain? How many times have you ever prayed in your brain only? Have you ever prayed on the brain? Sometimes, especially if, uh, if uh, you're sleeping and maybe you're scared somewhere and you're wondering, oh, um, it's like things are moving outside there and I don't want to shout so much. And you, you find yourself praying slowly until it's like you're praying in your brain. That means it's not really your mouth. It's not the words of your mouth which give you salvation. It is the belief from the heart. And when you believe from the heart, the Apostle Paul says, I believed, therefore I have spoken. You believe, therefore you have spoken uh, likewise. So believing is very, very important. Uh, so I hope that has been a blessing to you. Uh, you've been able to understand something. God bless you. Have a blessed time. Unless if there's someone who would like to make a comment. Uh, I can see uh, Andrea, you're here. If you'd like to make a comment kindly, most welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Give us a comment if you have one. Oh, I could just say actually, I'll feel oh, so uh -huh. scared, but I'll follow up. <laughs> all right, later. all right, all right. So, so yeah. you, you guys have a blessed, blessed time. I can see a couple of uh, people here who have been with us all through. I appreciate. Have a blessed time. On uh, today, I just wanted to speak specifically about justice just love through justice god had to show love using justice all right so you can be able to follow this video back again maybe on uh, on youtube or on facebook keith moki and also you can share the videos to many other people so that they can be able to hear so god bless you and see you on wednesday the same same time all right